Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, May 3rd, and we will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 21, and approximately verse 10, uh, because we've been off for a week, so if you're in the video world looking for last week, it was not there. I tried to say that the week before so you would know, uh, but this is, again, is May 3rd, and what we have is the time when uh, last time we were together, Yitzhak, Isaac was born, filled the home with laughter and with the joy. And now time has progressed. Uh, Yitzhak isn't an infant. He's, um, he's young, but he's already been weaned. And we know that was anywhere from probably, probably two or three years old. And we know that time has passed on since then. I'll be bringing that out, I believe, as we go on. So I won't say more about that at the moment. But uh, Abraham and Sarah had taken into their own hands to have a, a son uh, before they had Yitzhak. So Sarah had given Hagar, her handmaid, to Abraham. Ishmael was the product of that. It was the product of man trying to do what God said would be done rather than God doing it. And we've got a problem. We've got, in verse 9, it told us that Ishmael and his true character is making such a mockery of Yitzhak. He's making life absolutely miserable for him. He's laughing him to derision. He's poking at him constantly. And finally, Sarah has had enough. And that's why in verse 10, where we're picking up, she is saying to her husband, to Abraham, Drive out this slave woman and her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be an heir with my son, Yitzhak. In other words, God forbid that he's going to continue to grow up in the house with my son, get, you know, half of what is, is ours when we pass on, it belongs to this one, this is the son of promise, I want that one out, he's... He's ruining life for mine. And so uh, we see that, that she is lashing out because she's got that mama heart for her son and she is hurting. Um, you know, we see those that are not in line with the word of God, that are not led by the Lord. Sometimes they do have a vendetta against those who are trying to live godly lives and they go after them to persecute them. So this probably was a high level of persecution. It's not just the little sibling rivalry that, you know, sent them to their opposite corners, they'll calm down. There was more going on than this. There's even a hint from the language that is used that perhaps Sarah even thought one day Ishmael might kill her son. You know, maybe in a fit of anger or rage or whatever. So it was it was a bad scene. And so she wants the the uh, bond woman, the slave woman, and her son to be cast out. Yitzhak has the right to the home, the right to stay with Father Abraham. This is the one from God. He stays, the other goes. Now when we hear that and we look at that, we begin to know that God is showing us through this an analogy. Uh, an allegory, if you like that word better. I like analogy. I like the idea that this is a spiritual principle that we can learn from this. Ishmael is going to represent, and we're going to see this as scriptures develop it, he's going to represent the law. He's going to represent flesh. It, in the law, trying to keep the law, in our flesh, we find out we cannot keep the law, that we're in need of grace. Yitzhak is going to be the picture of grace, the picture of the spiritual. And law and grace cannot live in harmony with each other. If you're going to abide by the law and try to work your way to merit the favor of God, then grace has no part with you. And if you're leaning and trusting on the grace of God to give you what's undeserved by you, but God's freely giving the unmerited favor, then you're not going to be able to abide by the letter of the law, the letter of the law that kills, not the, you know, you're missing even the spirit of the law, that you'll see very quickly, these two are not in harmony. Let me take you to Galatians, because all Paul builds on this in Galatians. So go with me to Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to look quickly, I don't know if we'll read it all, if we don't read on your own, from verse 21 to verse 31. And here's where we see that, that, we're really being given a picture of the two different uh, worlds here, law versus grace. Verse 21, chapter 4, Galatians. Tell me, 
you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? There were those at this time that Paul's writing to that were called Judaizers, and they were saying, you've got to keep the law. You've got to keep the law. Yes, Yeshua, Jesus died for us, but you've got to keep the law. So they pretty much were doing law and Yeshua, Jesus, looking at that for salvation. That yes, Yeshua did it, but we've got to keep the law. We've got to merit it. We've got to earn it. We've got to earn favor with God. They're wanting to go back under the law and trust the law to help bring them to that point of salvation. That's not going to work. Grace is what Shaul Paul was raised to, to teach to the, the very young called out assembly to what, what I'll call the Messianic believers at this time. And he's trying to help them see you let go of the law as far as salvation. The law was a picture. It was to show you where you fail. It was under the law. The sacrificial system was to be a picture of coming Messiah. He has now come. You cannot now do the sacrifices and put your faith in those sheep to be a picture of when the reality has been here. In essence, it would be like if you went outside on a sunny day and your body is casting a shadow and someone comes to see you and as they approach, they see your shadow and they see you. And instead of embracing you, they look to the ground and they try to hug that shadow and they're talking to the shadow and they're ignoring the presence of the reality of the one who's there. And you say, well, how ridiculous is that? Well, these that were wanting to pull them back under the law and say, you have to keep the law, in essence, were doing that. They were missing that the law was pointing to. It was a schoolmaster. It was to tutor them. It was to train them in the fact that all have fallen short of God's perfect standard. And they now could let go of the sacrificial system. It doesn't mean that now there's no law, anything goes, now you can commit murder, you can steal, you can covet. No, of course not. But now we're not under those parts of the law that dealt with the, the, the covering for the sins. Because with Yeshua's shed blood on the altar, the sins are washed away. They're gone. And they needed to move on into that. We finally get into the book of Hebrews, where speaking to Hebrews, Jewish people, Jewish believers, Shaul Paul even is telling them because they've now been kicked out of the temple. The temple let them stay for a while because they were just like another sect. You had your Pharisees, you had your Sadducees, you had the Essenes, you had different groups that believed different things. But since these people, these Hebrew Christians were saying, we don't need to make the sacrifices. Well, the sacrifices would be made at the temple at the time of the temple doing these offerings and them not participating and saying, we don't need to do that. We've got our, our permanent well, the temple didn't like that, and they finally started kicking the Hebrew believers out and saying, you can't come to the temple. Well, our Hebrew believers, having grown up under the law, having hundreds of years with the law, having been taught if you don't keep uh, connected with Israel, with, with the temple, that you'll miss out. You'll be out of the commonwealth of Israel. You'll be out of the blessings of God, and when Messiah comes, you'll miss out on those blessings. That's how they were looking at it. So they were scared to let go of the temple. And Shaul Paul had to step in there and say, don't sail past your safe harbor of grace for salvation. Oh, Roger, the there's somebody at the door. Can you get it, please, before the dog barks? <laughs> Thank you. That no longer uh, do you have to do these things for salvation. Don't miss the safe harbor. Don't miss the grace that is yours. This is what is freely given to you now. If you can't go to temple, it's okay. It's not in the temple. But this was a struggle for them. This was a struggle for the Galatians. So there, there are those who are coming against the others. Oh, and by the way, too, they were also telling the Gentile believers that they needed to come in and keep certain parts of the law. They were saying, you got to still proselyte to Judaism to be saved instead of realizing that now you can let go of that. Now it's been completed in Yeshua Jesus. So that's why he's saying, those of you who want to go back under that law, those of you who want to keep the law, really? Are you listening to what the law says? We couldn't keep it. Why should we be saying we need to go back under it? Why should we be telling others they need to get under it when we know 
we couldn't do it. So now he's going to give the picture, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, Ishmael, one by the free woman, Sarah. Sarah. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Abraham and Hagar had intimate relations and a son was produced. Nothing strange there. That was just all how God's made us. And the son by the free woman through the promise. Remember both Abraham and Sarah's bodies were as good as dead. Yitzhak was miraculously conceived. God rejuvenated their bodies so that they could bring forth this life. Now he makes it clear. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants. Now, they're not literally two covenants, but he's giving the picture. One's proceeding from Mount Sinai, or Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. Well, what happened at Mount Sinai? That's where Moses, Moshe, gave us the law. That's where the law came. So if you're at Mount Sinai and you're having children, you're having them under the law to keep the law. They're slaves to the law. The one who this is, is picturing all this is Hagar. It says at the end of verse 24, she is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Jerusalem, you're under that. If you're trying to keep the law, earthly Jerusalem, you are under Mount Sinai. You're acting like slaves. You're acting like Hagar. You're, you're bound by this, and you're failing. You're not keeping the law. Okay, but the Jerusalem above, drawing on the heavenly picture, the heavenly Jerusalem, that one's free. That one, the free one, that's our mother. Now, Sarah was the free woman. She wasn't a slave. So Sarah is the one he's drawing on now. She's the picture for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Remember, Sarah first could not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. God changes it, and he brings out of barrenness life. We see that pictured in Yitzhak, and it is miraculous life when we come into Yeshua Jesus for our salvation, not by the law. We come in miraculously into new life. We're a new creation. And this is what the picture is giving to us. You, brethren, verse 28, are like Yitzhak. You're children of promise. If you're in Yeshua, you are a child of promise, not a child of the law. But as at that time, verse 29, he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now. We've got the same battle going on. What you saw in Ishmael and in Isaac literally and physically fighting each other and making Ishmael making life miserable, this is what's still going on. Those who are dealing with the flesh and are trying to, to be saved by the flesh, you're persecuting those who are saying that it, we're saved by the Spirit and by the Spirit only. So verse 30 then, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Cast out that law. Cast out the flesh. Cast out trying to do it by the flesh. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Yitzhak was solely heir. And when we come into Yeshua Jesus, we become heirs of our salvation. We become heirs, joint heirs with Yeshua Jesus. We are of the free. We are freely given salvation. We will freely come into the, all the blessings that are procured along with our salvation because we're of the free woman. We're not under that law. We're not trying to do it by our flesh, and we are not failing them because Yeshua Jesus did it all. And verse 31 says that, So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman. We're not children of Hagar, but we're children of the free woman. We're children of Sarah. We're seeing the difference there. So see how it specifically tells us here in Galatians. It's an allegory. It's a picture for us to understand what was going on in Bereshit, in Genesis, what's going on literally in this family between two sons is to teach us a greater, more important picture, the spiritual versus, and the spirit and grace versus the flesh and law. So we're being very encouraged there. These two are not going to coincide. We, we need to banish one. We banish the law. We banish the flesh. 
we banish trying to do according to the flesh. Now, in history, in the physical happening, back with Sarah and with Hagar, what we see happening, some say, well, Sarah was just a horrible woman. Let me give you a little insight to life at this time. We have tablets that were found. In fact, there's like over 600 of these tablets that tell us the customs of the Horites, the people that lived at the time of Abraham. In those, they gave rules and regulations. It would be as if somebody, hundreds of years from now, would dig up San Bernardino's, here's our city laws. This is what we abide by in the city of San Bernardino. Well, in the area they were living, we have these tablets that talked about slave women who did bear children to, for the, the man of the house, okay? So that wasn't an unusual event. It wasn't like Sarah got this bright idea, thought of it all by herself. No, she looked around and saw what others did, and she saw that other women who were not able to be pregnant and, and have babies would often give their slave to their husband, and the child that would come from that, that relationship was then declared to be the child of the actual wife. It was just the way the laws were written and were um, lived by. And in those laws, there was a rule that said the legitimate wife was forbidden to send away the slave woman if there was you know, reason for it, didn't matter, this was not allowed. If that slave woman had been brought in and had given birth, then she was not to be sent away by the legitimate wife. So Sarah, living by the rules of the land, could not kick Hagar out. So that's why she went to her husband Abraham and said, you get rid of her, because Sarah couldn't do it. She had no right to do it. But Sarah was so intent on it happening that she found a way around that law. Avraham could kick the slave woman out. She couldn't, but Avraham could. So it, it obviously was the customs of the day tells us there had been more problems than just what was in this one household. It, it had to have been, um, I don't want to say common, but it, it was something that obviously, I mean, if they made a rule, there was something going on. So... Abraham has been, his, his wife's at him, and I believe with an adamacy, <laughs> drive her out, drive her out now, is probably, you know, what her attitude was. What's Abraham to do? Verse 12, 11, I'm sorry, says, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son Ishmael. What we're hearing in that is Abraham is saying, but Ishmael is my son also. He had a love for Ishmael. I don't think Sarah did because anything that, that she had enjoyed with Ishmael, I think, fell by the wayside with the way that he treated her very own son, that it just killed off anything she felt loving toward him or motherly toward him. No, there was nothing there. But for Abraham, this was still his son, and so he was distressed by this. What am I going to do, God? My wife's telling me to get rid of him, but yet I have a love for him. So verse 12, obviously Abraham took his problem to God, what we all need to do when we have a problem, and God spoke to Abraham. In verse 12, he said, Do not be distressed because of the boy and your slave woman. Notice what he calls Hagar. He makes it very clear. He did not look at Hagar as a wife to Abraham. He didn't look at her as an equal to Sarah. She was still, in fact, his bondwoman, his slave woman. And so he's saying, don't be distressed because of Ishmael and because of Hagar. <clears throat> Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. Now here's the reason why Abraham, through Yitzhak, through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. So God's letting Abraham know, I've made a choice. I've chosen Yitzhak. I've chosen for the promise to come through him. This is what matters. So even though you have this issue in your heart, my choice does need to be protected. And he cited, in essence, I'm not going to put it that way because God doesn't side with us. We, we need to be on God's side. But God was declaring what Sarah is asking you to do. Go ahead and do it. We're going to see it's not the end. God doesn't cast them out and they go into 
you know, that into horrors. Um, we'll see a little bit more there. But what, what God is doing is reassuring Abraham what matters is the son of promise. This is the, where the attention needs to be drawn, and we're needing to move forward with Isaac. So he didn't say, no, Ishmael really should get 50-50. They should share their equal. No, God had a choice, and he did raise up one, and it's his right to do so. He is the one that miraculously produced Yitzhak, the son of promise. Now, the way Abraham treated Hagar also might seem strange to us in our modern age. But again, if we go back and we look at what the life was like at that time, I imagine many of you have heard of the Code of Hammurabi. This was the ancient code that people lived by. This goes back, um, it was the Babylonian law code for the area of Mesopotamia. Well, where did Abraham come from? Mesopotamia. He would have been raised in these customs and these laws. This would have been life to him. Now, many critics used to say there could not be such a detailed code of ethics and code of laws and way to live at the time of Moshe for Moshe for Moses to write the law that we have that we know about from Scripture. You know, this was just too far fetched. But Hammurabi's code was even more detailed than Moshe's code, and it was many years prior. So there was no problem for Moshe in the law as God gave it in his time, when already in Abraham's time, we've got a major code of ethics to live by. And in that code, we see many of the customs of what we're going through in the book of Genesis. That the way the people were living, the interactions that were taking place were just the way the customs of the day, I'll put it that way, the laws of the land. So in those laws, it was right to send one out. It wasn't banishment. It wasn't, I can get you on child support later. <laughs> you know, our rules and our laws and our lives are very different. But back then, this was custom. This was the, the code of ethics that they would be abiding by. And of course, God had a greater code of ethics. And we're going to see. He had provision for Hagar and for her son. In fact, he had promised that earlier. I think it's chapter 16. I'll give you the verses in just a few moments because it'll pop up in, a, in my notes and I'll remember exactly. But I want to say it's 16 around verse 20, I think. But let's look and read here and then we'll flash back. Okay, so God's told Abraham, do what Sarah's told you to do. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. So verse 14, Abraham got up early in the morning took bread and a skin of water, gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, gave her the boy, and sent her away. Um, by the way, let me just say too, as we see different laws that times change, go into our slave trade. Go into the, and I don't know what word is proper to use. So if I use a word that's offensive, forgive me, but let me just call them our, our black slaves, okay? Just please don't take any offense, anyone. But at that time when they were slaves, many a time the slave woman was impregnated, gave birth to a child. When that child grew up a bit, especially if it was a male child, the owner of that home that owned that slave would often sell that child off to someone else. And the mom didn't, couldn't say a word about it. She had to just watch her son go off and possibly away and never see her son again. Mm -hmm. And that was horrible. That nowhere is that justified in Scripture. Nowhere is that right. And I'm not advocating for it. I'm saying it's a horrible part of our history that should never have happened. But this is just to give you another indication. Here was the way that the laws were for the slaves at that time in our history. God forbid that be today. At Abraham's time, he's doing right, sending our way according to the law. But we're going to see God's in this. It's not escaping him. Hagar is not looked upon as less than human, nor is Ishmael. Okay, so Abraham doesn't waste time. God's told him, do it. He gets up early. He gets a little bit of bread and of water, gives him to Hagar, gives her also her son. He didn't just cast out one or the other. He keeps the family intact. He sends them both away. 
and she departed and wandered about the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, when it says gave her the boy, let me make clear to you the Hebrew word is yelled. He probably was at, le at the minimum 15 years of age and possibly even 17. How do we get that? Well, the word yelled used for a son or a child actually is used for male or female, but it's used for a child, it's used for someone in their youth. It's often used all the way up until that child marries. It's the same way that I've heard parents say in their 60s to their 40-year-old child, <laughs> you're still my child. Well, at 40 years old, we don't think of them as a child. We think of them as an adult. So in the same way, don't look at this and think, oh, this is a little boy. And it's mom going out with a little toddler and I go, well, how is she going to survive? No, he was old enough to even be able to take care of his mom should she need it. He was, you know, almost what we call adult age today. He was just short of manhood, if you call manhood 18, but in later in Jewish law, he's well past the age of 13 when they're declared a man. Yeah, I thought he was 12 when they went out to the desert, no? No, he was, and this is why. Ishmael was circumcised at 13, okay? Amazing. When he was circumcised, Isaac wasn't born yet. It's a year later that Isaac's born. So Ishmael should have been 14 when Yitzhak was born. And then Yitzhak has to be weaned before this happens. And even if we go for the earlier age of weaning, which is two to three years, there are some that make it five to eight years. I think two to three is more accurate. So even if we just add on two to three years, then we've got Ishmael being 15 to 17. Yeah. So he's at least that, if not even older. So that's how we derived at the age. Um, and by the way, if you want young man, in another place in Scripture, chapter 4, verse 23, I don't remember who it spoke of, but you can run back to there in Genesis, referred to one as a young man. So, he has sent her away. In essence, the conflict is over. The battle, the button of the heads, the law, the flesh against the spirit and against grace is now separated. And what we're seeing in allegory, in type, in picture, judicially we're seeing the life of the flesh has already ended for us our flesh is dead is crucified with Christ with our Messiah with the anointed one practically it's still here any of you over the battle of flesh and spirit you never have a battle with your flesh you just do great all the day long, day in and day out. Anyone want to raise their hand? I'm not raising mine. <laughs> I know it's a constant battle, but I know that the Lord looks upon me as spiritual. He looks upon me through the shed blood. The battle's over. I need to crucify my flesh to live my life today better for the Lord. But the battle's over. I'm not having to put my flesh down to procure my salvation and have it to know that I get it I don't lose my salvation because I act out in my flesh now if I'm acting out in my flesh my parent God has a right to child train me and child correct me and teach me mm -mm -mm, that's not the way you should act so again we're not casting all aside and saying hello just to have a free wonderful life no we're needing to be, we're needing to act as much as we possibly can to prove what has already taken place is true. We need to be acting in the spirit. We need to be acting out from the spirit, not from the flesh. But the battle is over. Hallelujah. It would scare me to death to think that I had to every day constantly be, uh-oh, I made a mistake. Lord, forgive me so that if I die, I can go to heaven one day. If I had to live under that kind of a cloud and that kind of fear, there would be no joy in my salvation. There would be no shalom in my heart. And what if the last five minutes before I did get hit by a car or something happened, I had just done something wrong, now I don't get to go to heaven? That would be a horrible, horrible way to live. And thankfully, our scripture shows this very clearly. The flesh is cast out. The battle is over. It's done. Move on in the spirit and by grace. And may your acts show that that's what has taken place. 
We're not of the bond women. We are of the free women. We are of our freedom and our salvation procured us by the Lord's atoning work. Jesus did it all. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus, period. So, Abraham knew his God. He knew that he's being obedient to his God, sending her out. So I, I'm of the opinion, and others that, that I study have said the same thing, that the very fact that Abraham did not send them out with a ton of supplies, he could have, he's rich. He could have sent them with flocks and herds and this and that. He was not expecting them to have to live on their own, by themselves, unto themselves, take care of themselves. He's figuring that, that God's going to be taking care of her and of his son. I think it's proof that God, that Abraham was putting his faith in God for them. Now, we know when Hagar was being mistreated by Sarah, but before we knew she was pregnant, and she ran away, that at that time God appeared to her, God taught to her, God told her to go back, and that she was pregnant, she was going to have this son. So we know that Hagar had been introduced to the true, one true and living God. She was not a stranger to the God of Abraham. He even spoke with her. And perhaps even in that is why Abraham is thinking, God's got a plan for her. God's going to take care of her. Now, I can't tell you that dogmatically. Uh, he could have even thought she'll go back to her family. We know that, well, we believe, we think, that she came out of Egypt. Remember, they're in southern Israel, so he could have felt that that's where, you know, she'll head, is down there. But whatever he thought, he gave them minimal supplies, get them by, thinking it's going to be a short time in the desert, they'll be where they are supposed to be. But what happened? She did the part, but she wandered. Did she lose her way? I don't know. It seems to me hard to believe that, you know, in that area that they could lose their way, but I didn't live back then. Maybe it was more complicated than what I know, and maybe she did have problems. Maybe she was trying to get down to Egypt and took a wrong turn. I don't know. Maybe she even thought, well, you know, I'll give Sarah a little bit of time to cool off, and then we could come back, and under her good graces, maybe she'll let us back in. I have no idea. One day we can ask, okay, but right now we don't know. We do know that Abraham has probably settled very close in the Gerar area. Remember when he went down to Gerar, he tells um, Sarah, you're my sister, you know, and uh, Avimelech, Abimelech, the one who was the head of Gerar, when he returned Sarah to Abraham without having touched her, he told Abraham, settle wherever you want. He didn't say, get out of my land, go back where you came from. He told him, you can settle, you know, wherever you want. And Abraham, being nomadic, probably did settle close to there. So they're probably in the Gerar area. It could be that, that she thought, well, I'll just hang around here and see if I can't get back in. We don't know, but she ends up wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba. Beersheba is in this area also. It's in southern Israel to this day. It's about 27 miles south of Hebron, Hebron, if you know where that is on the map. It's, of course, south of Jerusalem. It's another 27 miles south, but it was not named Beersheba yet. We get that information because if you take a sneak peek at down at the rest of this chapter, or I think 31, whoops, uh, yes, 31 tells us that the place was named Beersheba. But as Moshe is putting this together, he knows that's what happened, and so he goes ahead and tells us ahead of time, this is the area of Beersheba because it just made it more simple. It's like if I said to you, it's an area, and I named an area you knew by name today, it had an ancient name, rather than give it the ancient name, I'll give the name that you're accustomed to calling it. So the people that he was writing to knew this area as Beersheba, and that's why they called it that. And we do know from archeology span that there were many settlements in the area of Beersheba back at Abraham's time at the time we're talking about. So it, there's no problem with getting the name ahead of time. It's just, 
you know, by, by the time it's being written down and recorded for us, Moshe knew, oh, I can call it Be'er Sheva because that's what it's called now. So, um, again, it tells us there were settlements. She wasn't cast out into the desert, never going to see another human being again. You know, going to wander all the days of her life. No, that's not what she was being banished to. But things did go badly. The desert is very hot. It can get to you very quickly. You can get, uh, um, when you don't get enough water, dehydrated very quickly and easily. And apparently, that's what happened. Now, I can read all kinds of things into here. You can read all kinds of things. We can think that Ishmael maybe had an attitude and he was ranting and raving and using up his energy and he got himself overheated and with the sun, who knows, but whatever. He apparently became on the edge of a heat stroke or so his mom thought. So we see what happened. The water in the skin was used up in verse 15 and when it says she left the boy under one of the bushes, Basically, she let go of his hand. Now, again, she wasn't holding a little toddler, but it's like he suddenly dropped on her. Now, I can imagine if he's coming up to adulthood, he could be a very good-sized man, and if somebody is dead weight, that's far more weight than a woman is going to be able to hold up. So they could be walking side by side, and he's starting to, to stumble, and she's trying to station stabilize him. And as he's going down, she, she let go. But it does, from the Hebrew, give us the idea that it was like suddenly. So that's why I do think he probably was getting close to a heat stroke. We know someone very personal in our lives who we were concerned for the last few weeks that he, was, he came very close to suffering heat stroke also. So we know this is a real fact. And it, they'll, they'll fall exhausted and um, having great thirst. So... This is how he is, and Hagar says she went and sat down opposite him. Okay, let me back up. I missed the phrase. She left the boy under one of the bushes. There were um, individual bush, tree-like bushes that could give shade for one. They, they wouldn't be big enough for a, a lot of people to get under. Plus, if you're dealing with heat, you don't need somebody else's body heat. So she probably got him under one of these that was just a little bit of shade, trying to protect him a little bit from the heat. And then she moved just a little distance from him. This is where I see that she should have been crying out to God in her faith because God had made a promise to her. And here's my reference. Go back with me real quickly to chapter 16, Genesis chapter 16. And we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. I gave it to you a little wrong a few minutes ago. Genesis chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. Now, this is the God of Abraham that is having an interaction with Gar. This is when he lets her know that she's pregnant. Okay, verse 11 tells us the angel of the Lord. That's Jehovah. That is Yeshua in a form before he took on human form. I can give you a whole study on the angel of the Lord. We've gone through it before where we see that really is a picture of Jehovah, of our God of Israel. Okay, so the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, said to her further, Behold, you are with child. You will bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. The same way God named Isaac before Isaac was born, God named Ishmael also. And then he says, it's because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He's seen you've been afflicted. That your son, verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. Everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. That's a prophetic promise. Hagar. You're pregnant. You're pregnant with a son. You're going to name him Ishmael. I'm going to tell you what Ishmael's going to be like. He's going to be Henri. He is going to fight with everybody. Everybody's going to fight with him. He's going to be against everybody. And he's finally, I shouldn't put the word in finally, but he's going to live east of his brothers. Well, isn't Yitzhak one of his brothers? It's a half-brother. But this is one of his brothers, and I think it means more than just an immediate brother. He's talking about your relatives. So obviously he's going to live apart from the others. Now, where in that prophecy does God say he's going to live a short life, he's going to be kicked out, and he's going to die? 
Yeah, I don't hear that. This was a promise given to Hagar when she first finds out she's pregnant. That should have been held in her heart, and she should have held on to that. And at this moment said, God, help. You promised my son is to live a full life. We're going to see he's promised even more than what this is here. What's going on, God? Help. But she doesn't. She, in essence, lets go of him, moves away from him, and she thinks this is it. He's going to die. Question? Yeah. What would God uh, call him that? Why would you wish that Ishmael to be a wild man? It's not God wishing that. It is God telling us that's what it's going to be like. God is not willing any perish, but he knows not everyone will receive him. God has Adam and Eve conceive, and they have two sons, and one of those two ends up murdering the other, not because God wished that on him, and God made him do that, but God knew in his character what he was going to do, and God met him in it even, and even gave him a chance in and said, you know, sin's crouching right at your door, turn from it. You can have the same thing that your brother's got, and you can have the, the grace from me, basically. But if you don't choose it, that sin's going to absorb you. And that's what happened. He in, moved on forward in that sin. He took his brother's life, and he was cast out and had to live apart from everyone else and marked so that he wouldn't be killed, that nobody would go after him for revenge. Not God's choice. God was not willing, but he didn't force everyone to be the way he wanted because he would have had to make us robotic. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, is Ishmael, I mean, he'd be a wild man. Why? Why couldn't he just be, be a normal man? Because God was telling what his character was going to be like. See, God didn't say he has to be. God said, I see the future. Oh, okay. He's going, you're going to have a son. This is his name. This is what his life's going to be like. God told, um, oh goodness, I don't remember who it is. He named Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus was born. I can't remember now who, it's in Isaiah's prophecy anyway. But God said that Cyrus would make a decree that would send the people back rebuilding Jerusalem. And he named him Cyrus. In that same way, God's saying, here's what's going to happen. Here's the facts. I'm telling you them before they're going to happen. Right now, I can even bring it up to date. God has told us. The tribulation period is going to come. It's a horrible time. Judgment's going to be over the whole face of the earth. Mankind is almost going to kill himself off. If I didn't come back and stop it, there'd be no flesh left alive. That means out of all the billions of people on the face of this earth now, how many billions are going to die? Well, God could stop that. God could say, nope, I'm not going to let that happen. But instead, God's saying, I, this is what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. But let me tell you the final chapter. Israel, who I've promised will never be made an end of, is going to come through that tribulation. And I'm going to stop that battle, and I'm going to set her up and fulfill all the promises I made to her. I'm going to be on the throne on earth, and there's going to be a thousand years of peace. Now, we know that's truth. Nothing's going to change that. God said, this is what's going to happen. God said, Ishmael's going to be born, but he's going to be... He's going to be a brat. He's going to be cantankerous. He's going to be ornery. He's going to fight with all his brothers. He's finally going to live east of his brothers. And I read into that God saying he's going to have to get away from them because he's just nothing but trouble to his brothers. Mm -hmm. So God's just telling what you he see the future knows. Otherwise. Right, right, right. That's so. terrible to tell us, you're going to be a wild person. And a parent should never tell a child that. God didn't tell Ishmael that. And then Ishmael said, well, you know, this because you said it to me. No, God just simply told his mother, you're going to have this son, but he's going to be wild. He's, you know, he's not going to be a sweet, loving, gentle son. You know, but God said it to mom. He didn't say it to Ishmael. <laughs> You know, because I, I firmly tell parents, do not 
you know, tell your child you'll never amount to nothing because then when the child doesn't, it's partly because you have put that on that child. You put that curse so, on him. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't that God put a curse on him and he couldn't. It's just God knew the future. I forgot about God can see up ahead. Yes, God can see up ahead. He sees that parade beginning, middle, and end as done. We're at one stage of it, you know, either watching it start, waiting for it to start, seeing it in the middle, seeing it in, but God's looking and sees it overall, and he knows overall. And, uh, you know, I mean, he knew Satan would turn on him, and yet he still created Satan. If he didn't allow all that to happen, his love and his mercy and his grace would not be what we receive today. Is that the same as... When he says, I knew you before you were formed. Born, yes. Or formed yes. in the womb. He yes. knows what we're going to become. Yes. And gives us the choices. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I can say, God does not choose and say, you can be saved, you can't be. Eeny, meeny, miny, no, no. You know, that's not what God does. But God knows that, that you'll have that heart that when he tags at the heart, you'll turn to him. So that's when it says that according to his poor knowledge, he predestined us to be the sons of God. He didn't leave the others out, but he knew I'll choose every single one who will choose me. Every single one. I want to choose everyone, but not everyone will choose me. Um, we even see that and say that and know that, you know, oh, I knew you would make that choice, you know, I, I knew so I set this, you know, in motion. That's what God is saying, that, that he knew what it was going to be like. He knew Pharaoh was not going to soften his heart and it would be through those consequences of those plagues that finally the children of Israel would be let go. He knew Avimelech. Uh, who's like a pharaoh would have a heart that turned when he gave him that prophetic dream you know this is who you've got and if you touch her you're dead you know whoa <laughs> you know i don't know you god in a personal way but i know you're god and i respect you and and i want nothing to do with her so god used pharaoh at the time he used pharaoh to produce the result of the children of Israel leaving Egypt. God had Avimelech there because he could not allow Sarah's womb to be touched. There wasn't even a chance that Abraham wasn't the father of Yitzhak because mm -hmm. God knew this one, even in his heathendom, or heathen, heathenness, he, he, heathen <laughs> okay, that he would listen to God and obey God even though he didn't know him in a personal way. You know, he wasn't a worshiper of God. We don't know what happened in the future, whether that brought him into or not. I have no idea. But does that clear up? Okay, good questions. Because there are plenty of those around who say, well, I can't get saved even if I want to because God didn't choose me. Well, number one, we have no idea who's chosen and who's not. That's God's you know, doing and not ours. But number two, then God could not say that he so loved the world that he's not willing that any should perish. That one could say, well, that's not true. You are willing that I should perish. No, I shed my blood so you wouldn't have to. You have to choose to allow, because I am not going to force you. I'm not going to make you my puppet. Let me pull the string. I love you, God. No, mm -hmm. he wants it from the heart. If it's not real, if it's not genuine, then he has to say, what? can I say, I did everything for you. I died for you. I rose from the dead for you. There was nothing I didn't do for you. But you would not choose it. The story is told by <clears throat> Adrian Rogers, and I'm sure I won't remember all the details, and I'll try to shorten it. But he tried to give an analogy like we just got with, with here. And he said that there was this person on the sick bed, sick unto death, there was one formula that was extremely expensive. The doctor who was treating the man who was sick said, I know what you need. I know that this formula will save your life. I'm going to go get it. So he left to go get it. His son um, intervened before the doctor got on the road and wanted to go with dad. So son and dad are in the car going to get that formula 
to save this, the doctor's patient. They're in a horrible car accident. His, the son was killed. Mm. The doctor kept on, got the formula, brought it back to the sick man. He's covered in the blood of his son, and he hands the, the formula. He had bankrupt himself, took all of his money out of his bank to buy that. He bankrupt himself. He's got his son's blood on him. He hands the formula to the sick man who took it, looked at it, didn't like the looks of it, threw it on the ground, boat burst open, it spills out on the ground, it's lost, and then he looked at the physician and said, save me. What could the physician do? I bankrupt myself. I've got my son's blood on me. There's nothing short that I stopped from to save you, but you took the only thing that would save you and you discarded it. You threw it on the ground. You cast it away. You wouldn't have anything to do with it. I have no way to save you. That's in essence what an unsaved person is doing to God's precious gift, the blood of his son, and they're treating it with disdain, and they're spitting on it, and they're throwing it to the ground and they're saying, I want no part of that. I don't like that bloody way. I want another way. And God says, there is no other way. I bankrupt heaven for you. I gave you my all. I gave you my son, very part of me. I didn't stop at anything short. So whose fault is it when that sick man dies in his illness? and spends an eternity apart from the God he would not love. That's why no one, no one will stand before God and say, it's your fault, God. You didn't let me. You didn't, I wasn't born in America, so I couldn't hear. And God will say, look around you. You really think the world around you just happened? Really? Really? Those trees just happened to reproduce trees. They didn't reproduce doggies, and doggies didn't reproduce kitties, and kitties didn't birth fishes. And you really think all of this order and all of this that's so beautiful and all the lessons we can see and learn in all of God's nature, that that didn't show you there's a creator God? And did I not promise if you'll come to the light that I give you, I'll bring you more light? So have someone living wherever, where they're not hearing it. They can't go to a church on the corner. They can't, you know, they can't turn on the TV and choose between 15 preachers. They can't turn on the radio, but they've got creation around them. And if they say, wow, there has to be a creator. I want to know who that creator is. Then I've got missionary story after missionary story of how God sent the truth to those who wanted to know. And I will tell you, God would stop at nothing short. If he had to send an angel to show up and talk to that person in the last moments of that life to bring that truth to that person, you don't think he would? If he didn't stop at the death of his son, why would he stop short of anything? There's nothing more he could do. And we know stories like that. Showing the Jesus film in the middle of nowhere where they go in with generators and they put up a sheet literally in the middle of a desert and they put on this this film and they've got it you know where the, it's in the language that they're the, the people they're trying to reach and one story is given that they were guiding the people out to where this was going to be shown that night and we're talking you know the middle of nowhere they don't have street lights they don't have electricity and the generators that had lit the way suddenly gave way and it was complete darkness well the people who were curious very curious what is this that we're going to see they didn't know what to do they don't know how to go forward because they can't go in the dark but they know their way back home so they turned around to start to go back home it was going to be a total loss and suddenly suddenly a man appeared and said wait 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 i'll show you the way and he had a light and they turned around and they followed him. Now the missionaries that were putting
is Yochanan, John 6, 44. And remember just a little earlier, a little later, sorry, John 7, he's going to say that out of the belly flows rivers of living water. Let all who are thirsty come and drink. He's telling him, I'm your well. If you're thirsty, I'm your drink. Come and drink for me. You'll never thirst again, he told the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Yeah, give me that water so I don't have to come here again. No, 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 you're missing the point. This is spiritual water. God opened her eyes spiritually to see who he was. God was providing for her and probably provided miraculously. It's one of two ways. Either there was a well there, which I find hard to believe, and she just didn't see it, and suddenly she sees it, or I think more likely God made a well. He created this whole world. What is it to him to put a well where it's needed? And in that, as we see God supply her need, we see a number of points. Number one, the well was right there, right near her. When you think you have need of something, if you're crying out to God and it's a need, God takes care of your need. He may have to open your eyes spiritually to see it, because if you're looking in the physical, you're going to miss it. But God is near. The well was near. What she needed was right there. And the supply was plenty. She filled up that skin. She gave him water to drink. He's going to come back. And what do you do for someone who's dehydrated? Drench them. Fill them with water. Here's a whole well. She didn't find a puddle. She didn't find an oasis or a mirage, I should say. She found a well. A well has a lot of water. So all that she needed, all that he needed, all they both needed was provided. And notice it's not saying she had to dig for it. This was ready for her. I think of the one time I got to drink at Jacob's well, which was in Samaria, that's northern, so it's not this well down here. But even though it was a long ways down, there was a bucket, there was a way to get the bucket down, bring it up, pour the water out. However it was, she didn't say, there's a well, but I've got no bucket. You know, I think the water was right up there at the surface, and she was just able to take her little skin, fill it up, take it to her son. Go back and forth however many times was needed. But what I see is God. God is the provision. God had promised God was faithful. God was not against Ishmael. He wasn't against Ishmael's descendants. He had said, I'm going to make you a great nation. He promised Ishmael a good future. And I believe he even did it for Abraham's sake, because this was Abraham's son. And God loved him also. He just he was not to have the he was not to be the heir to the promises that were to go to Yitzhak to Yaakov, to Israel, and so forth. But that doesn't mean that God didn't have a plan for the other. The same way I say to you, dear Gentiles today, you are not second class, and you are not left out. God planned all along to bring the Gentiles in to receive the blessings. Remember, the Jewish nation was to take it to the Gentiles. God doesn't exclude anyone. And here he provided everything, everything she needed right there. She just had to have her eyes open to it. She had to be looking at her God. She had to be listening to her God. And then he was able to show her and take care of her. So verse 20, God was with the boy and he grew. He, he came back to robust health and he continued to live on. He did live in the wilderness. He lived in the Sinai Desert, the, the northeastern part would be south of Beersheba, but that name means beauty or glory. So it's not that it was necessarily a, 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 a sparse and, you know, there was a beauty there. And in fact, this Sinai Desert is where Moshe is later going to see the glory of the Lord. He's going to see that on Mount Sinai. They're probably close in that area. They're definitely in the range of it. So God, he, it isn't that they got banished to nothing. God took care of them. But it was aside from the promise that was to go on to the specific that would lead down to Messiah. Ishmael's line would never lead to Messiah. And in fact, we're not going to see Ishmael again until Abraham's death. And that's coming in chapter 25 and verse 9 if you want to peek ahead. But he is going to um, fade off the scene, so to speak. Because what matters is following that line that's going to lead to Messiah. So we're going to be following Yitzhak, not Ishmael. 
Yitzhak is a son of promise. This is the spiritual representation. This is where our attention is going to go. But God took care of Hagar. He took care of Ishmael. Ishmael lived in the wilderness and became an archer. That means he was a hunter. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Now they're on the road to having their own children, the nations that will come from him. But notice how mom got a wife for him from Egypt, so they couldn't have been that far from Egypt. He was Egyptian. That was a good match. God had a plan for them, and they do that they are the progenitor of the Arabs. And we've got the Arab races that are still with us today, who if they could trace their lineage all the way back, they would trace it back to Ishmael, where the Jewish people would trace it back to Yitzhak. So uh, God is faithful. In spite of us and in spite of how we're acting, God is faithful. Um, questions, comments? Okay, I'm seeing the time. Let me see real quick. I know I'm not going to get to the end, which I thought I would get to the end of the chapter today. Um, I'm almost wondering if we should stop here. Because we're going to go into what happens with uh, Avimelech, Abimelech, and Fecal, um, with Avraham. I think maybe I better stop because I, if I get started, I'm going to go at least to quarter to four, which we usually do. But I know I lose some people that drop off because um, they can't stay that late. And then I'm still going to have to cut it in the middle because I won't make it to verse 34. So should we stop here for the day? It's yeah, I could, I could um, maybe just give you a little tease. Um, and tell you that we're going to see Avimelech um, and Abraham have an issue. And uh, Abraham's going to, well, because you can read ahead and, and know it, there is going to be a covenant that's made. But it's very interesting in that covenant what's being shown and what a reversal from how it was with Abraham and Avimelech the last time we heard. We'll see a comparison. We'll look, actually, it's not a comparison, it's a contrast. Abraham before Avimelech, where Avimelech is calling him up short and saying, why did you do this lie? Why did you let me think she was your sister? Why did you let me bring her into my house? Why did you let me have a chance of God putting me to death? You know, why did you do all that? He pulls them up short, reprimands them, and, and gives him gifts. We're going to see a total change over here. What happens in the second round, <laughs> I'll say, between Abraham and Avimelech? What are we going to glean from it spiritually? Because we definitely will see what we can learn from this also. Um, and we've got something interesting about the numbers in there, according to the Hebrew. I'll bring you out something new that I learned, I think. I put it together, and I think I'm right. I'll bring that out to you. So we've got um, some interesting things. We'll look at Beersheba in Scripture. Um, it's an interesting location. It is very well-known city today bustling community um, back in the very, very late 70s, early 80s. In that time when I attended Biola, I was introduced to an Israeli who had gotten saved, and the one who saved him sponsored him to come to Bible college. Beersheba was his home. So it's, it's a special place in my mind because of him. It, um, they have a college. They, you know, it's, a, it's a bustling community in the middle of the desert. Beautiful. Beautiful area. And remember this area where um, uh, Ishmael and his mom are is also an area of beauty. So sometimes I think when we think wilderness, we think, you know, it's, it's desert, it's parched, it's, it's ugly, it's hard, there's nothing there. No, it was, it was a place of beauty also. So come back next week. We'll look at what happens round two with Abraham and Avimelech. We'll look at the change. It's quite an opposite. And we'll look at the name, the meaning of the name, the meaning of the number in the name. Um, there's a lot of little details in here that if you don't know the Hebrew and you just read past it, you'll still get the story, but you'll miss some details. So I'll leave it with that. Hope I've enticed you for next week. Do I have any questions, comments? 
everybody is too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to that. And uh, um, we'll close in prayer. I was going to say something, but I'll wait till after we close in prayer, then I'll have the mics open, and that way um, it will you know, feed into that. But let's go ahead and close in prayer. And we do praise you and thank you, Jehovah, the God of Israel, Elohe Israel, that you are faithful to your promises to Israel. But Lord, we're thankful that we see also you are faithful. You are faithful to any and all who you made promise to. And we, as your children, brought in through your shed blood, being joint heirs with you, that uh, we can be as sure of our promises in our future as Ishmael could be because you had promised him a future also. And of course, Yitzhak, the son of promise, received and we know Israel will continue and completely receive the promises given to her. But you are a magnanimous God and you have a, an ultimate plan to bless Jew and Gentile alike who love you and who come into saving faith through your shed blood and how we praise you and thank you for being the sacrificial lamb. Thank you for giving us eternal life. Thank you for opening our eyes spiritually. And Lord, may we take the opportunity to share with those around us whose eyes are closed that they might see the living well they might drink the waters of their salvation, and then they would be filled with joy also, crying out, Hoshana, God save us, because you do, and that is who you are, and we praise you all the day long. If you'd only saved us, it would have been Dayenu, it would have been enough, but we thank you that you also take care of us, guide us, lead us, bless us, <coughs> help us, Lord, you are our everything, and we want to always praise and honor you and show you our hearts of thankfulness. In the holy name of our Savior, Yeshua Jesus, Ome. Amen. Okay, we can uh, open the mics.